move today to eliminate Confederate symbols from the American landscape springs from the myth taught for two generations that the South seceded to protect slavery while the North invaded to abolish slavery. The claim is, is as preposterous as it is popular. No national political party in the entire antebellum period ever put forth a proposal to emancipate slaves. And Lincoln and Congress repeatedly made clear that emancipation was not the reason for invasion. All right, so today we're going to begin real quick with this book, uh, First Slavery and the Civil War. What your history teacher didn't tell you, A Handbook to Combat Revisionist History by Gary Bowers. In the introduction, it says, the most effective way to destroy a people is to deny and obliterate their own understanding of their history. George Orwell. And I'm in chapter one of this book, The Civil War That Wasn't. Of all the misconceptions about the American Civil War, perhaps the most superlative is its very name, a civil war by denotative or connotative definition occurs when a faction wishes to overthrow or control an existing government in order to impose its own ideology upon the governed. The southern states that seceded from the Union had neither the desire nor the plans to take command of the country, all right? They simply wanted to withdraw from it, and arguably, according to even some modern constitutionalists and historians, had a right to do so, based upon the nation's origins. Virginia, New York, and Rhode Island demanded that the right of secession be reserved before they would even agree to the Constitution, thereby implying that secession was indeed a right reserved by individual states. The United States had, after all, seceded from Great Britain only two generations before the states of the Confederacy did so, when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to 
dissolve the political bonds which have connected them with another, states the beginning of the Declaration of Independence that could not have been more applicable than it was to the Southern States in 1861, as will be exhibited in the pages following. Of the 30 or so named for the conflict assigned both during and after the war from both sides, there are several that describe it much more accurately than civil war. Note that this term was used in the very title of this book simply because it is traditional and recognizable, but not because it is accurate. Had some other of the titles been used, many, if not most people, would not know to what this work referred. Hereafter, it will be referred to as the war. All right, they ain't going to call it a civil war anymore, is what he's saying, because it really wasn't a civil war. It was just the war. The second most common name is the war between the states. However, biased northern writers and other revisionist historians is a conscious attempt to scapegoat the South began using the labels slave states for the Confederacy and free states for all others, ignoring the fact that up to 20% of slaves were held in the free states and thereby invalidating this title. All right, big one. We went over this on part one and two. It wasn't about slavery. We know that when Lincoln went and freed the southern so-called slaves, he didn't free the northern slaves they still were in slavery it wasn't about freeing slaves all right so uh, as it's saying here 20 percent of the slaves were in the so-called free states that's a fake title you fell for it slave states and free states all right they drew an imaginary line and they made you think that from that imaginary line in the south it was all slavery and everybody in the north was all free other names include according to one's loyalties the war of the rebellion the war of northern aggression the war to preserve the union and the war for southern independence so there's a lot of books actually with these titles and that's exactly what they're talking about you know every whoever's writing the story has his own view of it right the last is by the far the most accurate and relates the legitimate cause of the conflict so the war for southern independence that's why they went to war because the northern was coming no doubt about it they had to go to war with them in U.S. official government records, it is known as the War of the Rebellion. All right, even in the U.S. official government records, it's not even known as the Civil War. It's, it's called as the War of the Rebellion. Who's rebelling, huh? This title too is incorrect. In 1867, none other than U.S. Supreme Court Justice Salmon P. Chase noted in his declaration that Jefferson Davis or any other Confederate could not be tried for treason that secession is not rebellion so this label too is inaccurate all right it's not rebellious to practice secession when they felt like they had they didn't want to be part of that other government they had their own thing right they weren't trying to be rebellious or invade the north it is also known widely as mr lincoln's war which is not too far off based the brothers war which sadly is far too accurate our personal favorite as a matter of classical understatement is the late unpleasantness. But regardless of the plethora of names available, it is important to know that only one very obscure and rarely used title for the most devastating event in American history even mentions slavery. It can then readily be concluded that slavery was neither the cause nor the focus of the war, okay? Not the cause. All this talk about slavery as the cause of the war is a smokescreen to hide the stark immorality of the North's invasion. The South did not secede over policy questions regarding slavery, the tariff, Western territory, or any other policy. The South seceded for the simple reason that it wanted to govern itself and was capable of doing so. No one wastes time today wondering whether Scotland or Catalonia or the colonies in 1776 really had good policy reasons for secession. Their desire for self-government and their ability to do it was a sufficient reason. 
The question, therefore, that historians should be asking, which is the only question they ask, is why? Why did the South secede? But they should be asking, why did the North invade? All right, so I wanted to show you guys that there's a lot of books out there, you know, really talking about all this stuff. These are really quick books I found here. Um, I just wanted to correlate with the other book that we're going to get into, really, that we've been reading. Um, it says here, this book is called It Wasn't About Slavery, Exposing the Great Lie of the Civil War by Samuel W. Mitchcan Jr. Again, I remember, we got to dodge the hijack. We got to pull the babies out and get all the good info that when we know it's correct and dodge the hijack with their perspectives, again, their interpretations of what Abraham Lincoln was trying to say, all right? Because we know clearly he was a so-called black man. Just here in the introduction, it is all very simple. The establishment historian writes, the Civil War was all about slavery. The selfless and morally superior Union soldier, brilliantly directed by a prophet and saint, Abraham Lincoln, invaded the evil and decadent self with no other purpose than to liberate the oppressed and downtrodden Negro from his cruel, sadistic masters. All right, so that's the story they, that we grew up hearing, right? That's the kind of the story they put in our head and the, so we can picture something like that. It says here, filled with righteous indignation, these virtuous knights and military blue crushed the traitors and brought emancipation in heaven on earth to African Americans, <laughs> all while bringing defeat and chastisement to the poor. Ignorant Southerners, most of whom were slave owners or cruel overseers, who wipe their noses on their shirt sleeves and shoot tobacco, even the women. All right, so again, the guy's making fun of the story they told us growing up, right? That's literally what they told us, right? We wanted They wanted us to picture the South being evil, white, you know, slave masters who had only so-called blacks in slavery. And it wasn't like that. We already know, you know, over 200 presentations. We know there was black slave owners. We know most of the South, all these, a lot of these landowners were colored folks. We know the Huguenots. We know the Sephardic Jews and the Moors. We know the history, right? And we know a lot of these were American Indians too. The victor, as Churchill said, writes the history. But these historians have abused the privilege they went crazy with it, right? What passes for history today is cultural and intellectual nihilism, especially when it comes to the myth of the enlightened and noble federal cause. Their aim is not to seek the truth, which should be the ambition of every legitimate historian, but to serve an agenda, all right? They have an agenda when they're lying to us about like the Civil War. They are saying instead, forget the past unless it fits the narrative of which we pro prove because everything that occurred before us is irrelevant and inferior to our views and therefore should be forgotten, modified, corrected, contextualized, or destroyed altogether. Is it possible to be more narcissistic? The French philosopher Bernard of Chartres remarked a long time ago that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Sir Isaac Newton made a similar pronouncement, but he added, that the purpose was to see further, not to look down on the giants in scorn. I agree with Bernard and Sir Isaac and intend to teach history properly, standing on the shoulders of giants, seeing further, not to erase or rewrite history into an acceptable form by looking down, in my case, on the American South. The primary purpose of this book is to help bring some balance to the debate about what happened in the pre-Civil War era. First off, all i confess that i do not believe it was a civil war again it wasn't it wasn't really a civil war they were forced into remember most military schools outside the united states define a civil war as a struggle between two or more factions for control of the government establishment intellectuals have redefined the term in america in order to provide moral cover for what i call the lincoln regiment yet if the standard international definition is accepted one would have to conclude that the objective of Robert E. Lee, Stonewall Jackson, etc., was to conquer and rule New York City, Chicago, Baltimore, Detroit, and the rest of the North to label our 1861-1865 struggle a civil war. This, of course, is absurd, though I dare say that all four cities and many more would have benefited immensely from being Confederate military dictatorship. If we reject the term civil war, 
what is a good name for the conflict? All right, so again, here goes a whole nother book talking about the name. And again, it depends on the person's viewing's perspective and their experience with the so-called civil war. It says here, some people prefer the war of the rebellion, favored by many Northerners in the 19th century. Others prefer the war between the states, while some refer to it as the war for the Southern independence. Stonewall Jackson called it our second war for independence. I prefer the war for Southern self-determination, which it was. If we apply modern usage of self-determination, after all, if we self-determination is good enough for Bosnia and Herzegovina, why isn't it good enough for Alabama, Mississippi? However, I will use the Appalachian Civil War in its place since it is widely understood and it confirms to the current usage, but it is nothing more than shorthand for the war for Southern self-determination. There would have been no war had the North not invaded the South. This question is suppressed because an honest answer to it would not be morally attractive. Historians have yet to confront the hard moral truth that the best solution to all the problems facing the Union in 1861, including the moral problem of slavery, was a negotiated division into two federations. All right, and we continue in the book, Slavery and the Civil War, What Your History Teacher Didn't Tell You, a handbook to combat revisionist history by Gary Bowers. Now we're in chapter three of this book. It says here, Lincoln, the great emancipator who wasn't. Let it be unequivocally said of Abraham Lincoln that he detested slavery on moral grounds. Let it also be said that he did not send federal troops into the South to free the slaves, but to preserve the Union. Further, if he were alive today, he would be considered the vilest of racists. Modern political correctness, notwithstanding, he held most of the attitudes common in his day. Lincoln was not an abolitionist. Lincoln held no animosity toward the slaveholders, though he could not remember a time when he did not abhor the idea of slavery. He found the Northern abolitionists to be extreme, self-righteous and unrealistic and underestimating the difficulties that would ensue were slavery to be abolished. All right, these are all his quotes. Further, he did not denounce the slaveholders. I will surely not blame them for not going what I should not know how to do myself, he said. In fact, Lincoln said of the slave owners, if slavery did not exist among them, they would not introduce it. If it did not exist among us, we should not instantly give it up. These are not the words of a man who invaded the southern states in order to free the slaves or punish the slave owners. As munificent as his philosophy was toward slave owners, Lincoln held no such feeling toward the Negro. All right. Now, what do we know here in this community about Lincoln? A big thing that they probably never going to mention and not thinking about when they're writing this book right here, which is that Mr. Lincoln, right? was a so-called Negro too, right? Lincoln was a Negro. So again, it wasn't about freeing so-called Negroes because he was a president and he was a Negro. Aside from the slaves of his wife's family, who were incidentally her slaves by familial tradition, so his wife had slaves, right? He had little contact with the black race. Now touch the hijack big time, crayon colors, he was so-called black. He spoke of the taught slaves as being treated in paternalistic fashion. Now remember, they're trying to say that slaves, literally, like listen to what they, how they're writing this book, that because he didn't know any slaves, that meant that he didn't know any black people. Because he's trying to say all slaves were black only. You see, so Dodge the hijack big time when we're reading these books. I just want to show you that many people have written a whole different version of what we hear all the time. Again, this is a whole different book. Lincoln was not, he didn't care really about freeing people or, 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 or he, didn't, he didn't care to free so-called blacks. It wasn't about that. It was all about preserving the union. It's all about that money back. Shout out to Back for What's Mine. Continuing, as indeed a great majority of slaves were treated in paternalistic fashion, meaning that was their dad and mom who had them. 
they were family paternalistic fashion many slaves were treated like that like that like if it was their parents because a lot of them was their parents they owned their kids a lot of the time so they wouldn't be sold continuing here a little further down the book it says lincoln's lack of admiration for those enslaved did not end there not only did he think they should not be equal citizens he wished them removed from the united states my first impulse would be to free all the slaves and send them to liberia on december 3rd 1861 now remember we're getting the guy's version of what he's interpreting from lincoln saying so I, there's nowhere in his words that would say i am a white person you know so he's interpreting it on his way but he did send what colored people over to like you know he wanted some to liberia and central america yeah he did want to do that like marcus garvey lincoln urged congress to appropriate money for the deportation of blacks at that time he preferred either liberia or central america as their ultimate destination as late as 1863 lincoln had not given up on his deportation plan though general ulysses s grant had wanted to military Terrorly take over the Dominican Republic and send them all there. <laughs> you hear that? Lincoln followed through with his plan of removal of an experimental basis and sent 450 black freedmen to Haiti. Almost half died of smallpox and starvation. Do you hear that? And remember, Lincoln is a so called black man. There can be no question that his purpose in the war was definitely not to free the slaves. In his inaugural speech on March 4, 1861, the new president said, I have no purpose, directly or indirectly, to interfere with the institution of slavery. I believe I have no lawful right to do so, and I have no inclination to do so. I, he did say all these things. Remember, we got these on parts one, two, and three. All right. Immediately following secession, Lincoln and the U.S. Congress offered the South the Corwin Amendment, which among other things guaranteed permanent slavery forever in the seceding states, if only they would return to the Union. I only if you become to the Union. Three states had already ratified the amendment when Fort Sumter was fired upon and approved became moot. When the war began, the U.S. House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed a resolution with which Lincoln agreed declaring the purpose of the conflict not only did this document not even mention slavery i remember the corwin amendment it doesn't even talk about slavery as a cause it asserted that slavery would be preserved should the north win and the union be reunited all right it even said that in light of such events it is patently absurd to assume the north invaded the south to free the slaves Further, if the war had been initiated to end slavery, Lincoln would not have waited almost two years to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. It is quite apparent that this motive was added ex post facto to conceal the reason, the real reason for the North's invasion, economic hedge money. It's all about the money. It wasn't about freeing slaves. The Emancipation Proclamation was even two years late, right? In the first year of the war, U.S. General John Fremont took it upon himself to free the slaves of Confederate sympathizers in the border states of Missouri. Lincoln modified the order to comply with the Confiscation Act, by which troops could only see slaves actually used in aid of the rebellion. His concern then was not emancipation, but the continued loyalty of the border states. The Department of the South, a Union military commander led by David Hunter, declared in 1862 that the slaves of South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida be forever free. Upon learning of this, Lincoln declared that pronouncement altogether void and resigned the order, though it was basically the same as the Emancipation Proclamation that would be issued the following year. All right, He was forced to do that. Hunter then formed a regiment of fugitive slaves. Lincoln and the War Department refused to commission or pay for the black soldiers. Hunter returned them to their owners. All right. Again, remember Dodge the Hijack. A lot of this could be pale skinned people too. And again, a lot of this also most likely includes American Indians. All right. Lincoln then went on to fire Secretary of War Cameron primarily because he advocated making soldiers of so-called Negroes. All right. 
It wasn't until the issuance of Emancipation Proclamation in 1863 that Lincoln gave approval for the use of colored soldiers. That was like the proclamation itself, a matter of politics and expediency, for he stated that slavery enables the enemies of free institutions to taunt us as hypocrites. It was not his love for blacks or even his opposition to slavery that was important, but the perception of other countries that were leaning toward support for the South. Perhaps the most definitive statement Lincoln made concerning slavery connection with the war came in an interview with the famous journalist Horace Greeley two years after the conflict had begun. My paramount object in the struggle is to save the Union and it's not to save or destroy slavery. Again, that was Lincoln. We got this in the other parts. He straight up said, my paramount object in this struggle is to save the Union and it is not to save or destroy slavery. He went on to say that if he could only save the Union by keeping slavery, he would do so. This war was not about freeing the slaves. Just consider this. As of 1861, the South produced nine presidents, the North, six. But more important, five Southern presidents served two terms. No Northern president ever served two terms. In the first 64 years, 51 of those were under Southern presidents. And you see why New England felt oppressed. No, um, that number would be higher, uh, most likely, if Polk had not imposed on himself a rule to serve only one term. Had Zachary Taylor not died in office, Millard Fillmore would not have been president. And it is likely that William Crawford would have won against John Quincy Adams in 1824 had he not suffered a stroke during the election. If these things had happened, then in the first 64 years, only eight years would be under Northern presidents. Je uh, Southerners created Jeffersonian America. Look at attorney generals from the South, 14, the North, 5. Supreme Court justices, 17, the North, 11. Speakers of the House, the South, 21, the North, 12. Southerners were crucial in securing independence from Britain and in forming the Constitution. All the territory acquired by the United States beyond the original 13 states was acquired by Southern administrations. As of 1860, the United States was very much a Jeffersonian regime, governed largely by Southerners. Here, this book is called, It Wasn't About Slavery, Exposing the Great Lie of the Civil War by Samuel W. Mitch Cam Jr. The real cause of the war says here, the Northern onslaught upon slavery was no more than a piece of specious humbug designed to conceal its desire for economic control of the Southern states. Charles Dickens, 1862. No soldier on either side gave a damn about the slaves. Shelby Foote, American historian. For the love of money is the root of all evil. One Timothy six thing, there you go. <laughs> And now we come to the real cause of the war, money. Most wars have been about money or the transfer of riches and territory, which also equates to money eventually. This economic factor should never be ignored. Shortly after the Revolutionary War, the United States decided to transfer all state war debts to the federal government. This was a great benefit to the North. Their states were freed from their massive debts, now paid by the central government. The primary way the U.S. government had to raise funds was a via tariffs, mostly from Southern resources. From the beginning, the South was footing the bulk of the expenses of the government. William Grayson, one of uh, Virginia's first U.S. senators, warned that he was afraid that the South would become the milch cow of the Union. Grayson proved to be prophetic. Speaking in 1828, Thomas H. Benton, who opposed slavery, told the Senate before the revolution, the South was the seat of wealth, as well as hospitality. Money and all its commanded abounded there. But how is it now? All this is reversed. Why? Benton rhetorically asked himself. Federal legislation was his answer. 
Virginia, the two Carolinas, and Georgia may be set to defray three-fourths of the annual expense in supporting the federal government, and of this great sum annually furnished by them, nothing or next to nothing is returned to them in the shape of government expenditures. Benton went on to say, the South must be exhausted by its money and its property by a course of legislation which is forever taken away and never returning anything. Every new tariff increases the force of this action. No tariff has ever yet included Virginia, the two Carolinas, and Georgia, except to increase the burdens imposed upon them. After seeing Senator Benton's remarks, the reader might as well ask, why didn't the South leave the Union earlier than it did? Part of it came close during the nullification crisis. Only after Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun reached their tariff reduction agreement in 1833 did South Carolina back off secession. For despite the high tariff rates, the South and North both prospered then because they had a symbiotic economic relationship. When the Southerners bought their slaves from the janky flesh peddlers, they were using money loaned to them by northern banks. The worldwide industrial revolution was based largely on textile manufacturing, which required enormous amounts of cotton. The South produced more than 75% of the world's cotton, where the South, America, America, terrestrial paradise, right? Agriculture. The New England textile industry was built on this cotton which was mostly planted, cultivated, picked, and ginned by slaves. Cotton produced by slaves built the North prosperity like that of the Deep South. Even the northern shipping industry depended on cotton and slavery. The North sent supplies, especially food and clothing, to the South via ship. These same vessels took back cotton, much of it produced by slaves, to the New England textile mills, of which there were thousands, they then used it to manufacture textiles, which they shipped abroad. As James Madison said, the road to prof profitable trade for New England ran through the cotton fields of the South. Wall Street and the Northeastern banking industry also indirectly depended on cotton and slavery. Plantation owners often borrowed to buy new land and slaves, and New York banks were more than happy to loan money to them. Cotton was America's number one economic product, all right? Cotton accounted for more than half of all exports. The export value of cotton alone stood at 161,434,923 in 1859. That same year, the total value of all exports from North stood at only 78,217,202. In other words, the value of one southern product accounted for more than twice the value of all northern exports combined. As the country moved towards civil war in the late 1850s, the tax scales were tilted heavily against Dixie. President Buchanan told Congress the South had not had her share of money from the Treasury and unjust discrimination had been made against her. By 1860, 80 to 90% of federal revenue came from the southern export trade, which was largely built on slavery. Leonard M. Scruggs, a distinguished author and historian, put the figure even higher at around 95%. Here we see the real reason Abraham Lincoln and the more moderate Republicans did not wish to disturb slavery in the South. From its establishment up until 1861, the United States government was mostly funded by Southern agriculture and especially the cotton industry, much of which depended on slave labor. If slavery were abolished, federal funding would be eliminated with it. Thus, Lincoln and his allies only opposed the expansion of slavery into the territories. In doing so, Northern Republicans could create and then keep their lock on political power by adding more and more non-southern states. The southern states would become isolated and politically impotent vassal provinces and economic colonies easily 
dominated and bullied by more populist North, which would be in a position to pick their pockets when it, wherever it wished. Consider the moral tariff as a prime example. No sooner had the lower tariff of 1857 passed than Northern elements in Congress began to ag agitate for its replacement. In 1858, Representative Justin Smith Morrill of Vermont introduced the Morrill Tariff in Congress. It would have raised the average dutiable ad valorem tax on imports from just under 20% in 1860 under the Tariff of 1857 to more than 36% in 1862 and a whopping 47% within three years. Predictably, some of the protected northern industries and corporations needed to import specific items so they were classified as non-dutiable non-taxed the self accounted for close to 82 percent of the u.s export business and for more than 83 percent of american tariff revenues even before the moral tariff about 80 percent of these revenues went to public works projects railroads and industrial subsidies in the north and rich and northerners at the expense of the south the moral tariff would make this unhealthy situation even worse despite its blatant unfairness it passed the house of representatives by a vote of 105 to 64. only one of the south's 40 representatives voted for it the moral tariff was and protective tariffs in general are particularly hard on exporters By driving up the cost of imports, this tariff especially jeopardized the South's cotton market in Europe because England could develop new production regions and colonies such as India and lower the cost of imported cotton. The Southerners also faced retaliatory tariffs. Congressman Tadeusz Stevens of Pennsylvania was one of the sponsors of the Moral Tariff. He acknowledged that the bill would cause suffering in the South and West and would particularly hurt the poor, who would have to pay more for products, but it would benefit the Northeast through increased industrial production and the higher prices manufacturers could charge consumers. Stevens was a radical abolitionist and an excellent speaker, but not a nice person. He was profoundly anti-Southern and anti-Christian as well, once declaring that the Bible is nothing but the obsolete history of a barbarous people. He felt that if the South wanted to be prosperous, it should abolish slavery and become like the Northeast. That the South did not want to be like the Northeast was a fact that he simply could not understand and he viewed it with mal malice. Fortunately for the South, Robert M. T. Hunter of Virginia shared the Senate Finance Committee. He bottled up Morrill's proposed tariff in committee so that it became an issue in the 1860 election campaign. Both Douglas and Breckenridge opposed high tariffs, but not Lincoln. His support of the Morrill tariff helped him carry the critical states of Pennsylvania and New Jersey by a plurality. So that's what helped Lincoln win a little bit, huh? The Northern protectionists were pleased when the Deep South seceded and, it, and its senators went home. They had long wished to use the federal government to enrich themselves, but had found their way blocked by small government scruples of the Jeffersonian constitutionalists. If the Northern industrial special interests could raise the tariffs on imports from Britain, they could sell Northern products at higher price and thus reap higher profits. This is what Calhoun was trying to block when he demanded to know what business the government had picking the winners and losers in the private sector but jefferson was dead calhoun was dead and jefferson davis had retired to his plantation on the mississippi river now the northern protectionists could ram their tariffs through congress without southerners blocking them lincoln and his army could always force the south back into the union later if necessary At this time, of course, they had no idea what it would cost. To do justice to the protectionists, they did not think force would be necessary. Many of them, Lincoln among them, until April 4th, 1861, thought the South was bluffing. Union General Don Piat recalled, his views of human nature were low, but good-natured. 
This low estimate of humanity blinded him to the self. He could not believe that men would get up in their wrath and fight for an idea. He considered the movement self as a sort of political game of bluff, gotten up by politicians and meant solely to fight in the North. They, the Southern politicians, won't give up the offices. I remember, he said, Lincoln's ambition in life was to hold high office, and he could not believe the Southern leaders would voluntarily give up their seats in the Senate and other high places. But the South was not bluffing. The moral tariff easily passed the House again, 105 to 64. With the Deep South senators gone, Senator Hunter could no longer bottle it, bottle it in committee. It passed the Senate 25 to 14 because Lincoln and the Republican Party had made the tariff's passage a major campaign issue and a test of party loyalty. Republican congressmen voted for it 89 to 2. In the Senate, Republicans voted it 24 to 0. It is worth not noting that the tariff bill had priority even before excluding slavery from the territories. President Buchanan signed the tariff into law on March 2nd, 1861, two days before he left office. For practical purposes, Henry Clay's America system was now the law of the land. It had been Lincoln's political North Star throughout his public career. But the America system, whatever its aims, only helped the North. The Constitution allowed the federal government to collect tariffs to fund itself but it had never been meant to enrich some people at the expense of others. Now the Constitution was irrelevant. Turned on his ear, it no longer served as an instrument to limit federal power. The moral tariff is a powerful and astonishing example of short-sighted partisans, greed, and its catastrophic consequences. Leonard Scrugg wrote later, the terms of the moral tariff were so harsh that it virtually forced the rest of the South, Arkansas, Tennessee, North Carolina, and Virginia out of the Union. Maryland, Kentucky, and Missouri might have left too, had they been allowed to do so. After a 40-year history of economic abuse, the ties that bound the Union together disintegrated altogether. The Southern states which remained in the Union saw that they would be treated unfairly by the North the moral tariff, the North's refusal to enforce laws it didn't like, an open Northern sympathy with terrorists pushed the Southerners over the edge. Many who had been pro-Union before Harper's Ferry and the Moore's tariff now favored secession. There was a solution to the slavery problem, but it required recognition from all parties that it was a national problem that needed a national solution in which all parties sacrificed. All parties had profited from slavery. The irresponsible abolitionists only offered sacrifice from other people while most northerners, many of whom had been more than willing to share in the profits associated with slavery directly and indirectly, were unwilling to share in any sacrifices. They were not willing to help pay for a comp compensated emancipation. For example, like pay the slaves, right? Pay. It's, it's a small wonder the Southern newspaper of the day editorialized about Northern hypocrisy. Lincoln and his funnies had grand plans for the money they would get from their monstrously high tariffs. They did not believe the South was likely to go to war over this issue. They were dead wrong. Some Northern apologists tried to dismiss the moral tariff as a cause for the war by pointing out that it had not passed the Senate before the South seceded. Author James Spence, however, addressed this issue in 1862 when he wrote, the cotton states had indeed seceded previously, but why? Because as we have seen, political power had passed into the hands of the North and they anticipated from the change an utter disregard of their interest and of course of policy opposed to spirit of the Constitution and to their rights under it. Was it possible to offer the world more prompt or convincing proof than this tariff affords that their apprehensions were well founded? Some historians have questioned whether the South could have been a viable nation. However, 
the antebellum South was wealthier than many people today realize. Had it been an independent country, listen to this, the South did have all the wealth. So they could have been an independent country, it says. And if they had been in its own country in 1860, its economy would have been ranked the third largest on the European and American continents. Third largest. Dixie had 33% of the nation's railroad mileage and was ahead of every other country in the world, except, of course, the United States as a whole. It also had navigable rivers that did not freeze, several excellent ports, and a per capita income 10% higher than all the states west of Pennsylvania. Its wealth was not confined to the affluent planter class. It also had a large, highly industrious class of yeoman farmers. Most of them did not own slaves. Only about 6-7% to of the Confederate enlistees had slaves. Slaveholding yeoman farmers usually had only one or two. They labor in the cotton fields right beside their chattels. A lot of these people, again, it was just family working together. A lot of the, that's why they work inside to side. It just owned they owned their family, or they were set to own their family. They listed them like that in the slave schedules. It was just indentured servants. A lot of these people, but it is true that many were ambitious, ambitious to own more. After all, the first mad masters who lived in the big house were not born there. Most of them started out picking their own cotton. What? Big one right there, right? Most of these masters, how did they start out? They were picking their own cotton. What does that mean? They were slaves before, right? But I thought only black people, so-called black people were slaves, huh? Now you see? Now that secession had come, most of the middle class in the deep south looked toward the future with optimism. Now they would be able to keep more of their hard-earned income under a government that understood them better and was less exploitive and corrupt than that of the United States as a whole. The Buchanan administration and Congress did not take any steps to coerce the South back into the Union for two reasons. First, they knew they had no constitutional right to do so. Second, the people of the North did not want them to return by a margin of about two to one. At first, the northern newspapers were also ready to let our errant brothers depart in peace. Horace Greeley, the editor of the New York Tribune, wrote, The South has a good, a right to secede from the Union as the colonies had to secede from Great Britain. We must separate from them peacefully. The Albany Atlas and Argus declared, and it went on to blame the Republicans for causing South Carolina's secession. The pro-Lincoln Indianapolis Daily Journal said that we are well rid of South Carolina and expressed gratitude to her for leaving. If all the South follows her, let it. The New York Journal of Commerce declared that it was time to stop assigning blame and to face facts. The Union is, in fact, already dissolved, it said, and it was time for Washington to adopt a policy of limiting secession not to raise an arm, men to butcher their friends in the South. The Detroit Free Press wrote, the people of these states, driven to desperation by the incessant warfare of abolitionism upon their most cherished rights, have withdrawn themselves from among us, and Washington should recognize the Confederacy or go to war. The Prowl Douglas newspaper hoped for peace, but if there were a war is said the blame would lie with the Republican Party. Even the Northwest Daily Tribune, a pro-Lincoln newspaper, said that if the South opted to form an independent nation, they would have a clear moral right to do so. Only gradually did it occur to some of them what this would mean economically. A Manchester, New Hampshire newspaper warned its readers, the Southern Confederacy will not employ our ships or buy our goods. What is our shipping worth without it? Literally nothing. The transportation of cotton and its fabrics employs more ships than all other trade. It is very clear that the South gains by this process, and we lose. No, we must not let the South go. The pro-Lincoln New York Evening Post pointed out on March 12, 1861, that if the government should not collect revenues from the seceded states, the nation will become 
bankrupt all right so all that reading basically a lot of people were saying that hey man you can't let the self succeed you can't let it be its own no me that's our economy we're gonna go bankrupt here in the north it's all about the money right it was now clear that many of the northern politicians had seriously miscalculated the deaths of southern feelings about the tariffs northern hypocrisy disrespect for the rule of law hate-filled abolitionist propaganda slavery protecting terrorists encouraging servile insurrection corporate welfare cultural arrogance and a host of other matters that provoked secession the southerners had in fact exercised their constitutional right to leave the union had formed their own government and were now building their own army to defend it if needed but a successful confederate states of america would also devastate the north economically the new government in montgomery alabama enacted a tariff but set the maximum level at 10 percent they felt that if 10 percent was good enough for god it was good enough for them rather than pay the 47 percent duties for doing business in northern ports the countries of the world would prefer to pay 10 percent in new orleans mobile savannah Charleston, etc., and reap a huge dividend in the process. Many in the North now realize that the South must be cajoled or forced back into the Union if the North was not to face dire economic consequences. But how was that to be done? Abraham Lincoln, ever the calculating politician, had an answer. Now, there's a myth propagated uh, by New England elites in the early 19th century that Southerners were lazy, ignorant, and generally poor when compared to industrious New England. Although English historian Michael O'Brien and a number of other scholars have soundly refuted the myth, it is still fixed in the popular imagination, especially in that of Southerners themselves. Who, who sometimes readily identify with the redneck image. Talk about Stockholm Syndrome. Consider the following, though. Nobel laureate Robert Fogel co-authored with Stanley Ingerman a study of the economics of the Old South titled Time on the Cross, which I, I recommend. They showed that white Southern agriculture was actually more productive than Northern white agriculture, more productive, and that plantation agriculture was more productive than either. The South in 1861 had the fourth largest economy in the world. The first commercially successful railway line in America was built in Charleston, South Carolina in 1830. It was called the Best Friend of Charleston. It ran 136 miles and was the largest railroad line in the world at that time. Pretty backward, right? As of 1861, the South had more miles of railroad than any country in the world except the North. The 1860 census shows that the South greatly outranked the Northern states in per capita income. Now, this is almost difficult to believe, but you can look at the census yourself. The 12 highest annual per capita income states were all in the South, all of them, the 12 highest. The highest was Mississippi with an annual per capita income of $2,128 a year. South Carolina, $2,017. The highest Northern state, the highest was Connecticut with $771. A little more than one third that of Mississippi. New York's share was $597, less than a third that of Mississippi. In South Carolina, the poorest, uh, sorry, Mississippi and South Carolina, the poorest southern state was Arkansas at 881, which was higher than any northern state. Even if slaves are counted in the average of income earners, only three northern states make it to the top 12 Connecticut, New Jersey, and Oregon. So this was an amazing uh, thing in itself. All right, so now we're going to get into uh, this book again. This is a book we got on, uh, gone over in, I believe, part two and three uh, of this series. 
we're going to go to chapter three uh, in this uh, video. Again, this book is called Slavery was not the cause of the war between the states. The irrefutable argument it says here includes Lincoln and Fort Sumter, the famous treaties by Charles W. Ramsdale. This is by Gene Kaiser Jr. We go to part one. All right. Chapter three of part one. The economic annihilation of the North, the true cause of the war. The North cut off from Southern cotton, rice, tobacco, and other products will lose three fourths of her commerce in a very large proportion of her manufactures. And thus those great fountains of finance would sink very low. Would the North in such a condition as that declare war against the South? Henry L. Benning, November 19, 1860. The cause of the war itself is not complicated. The South seceded and the North immediately began a dramatic economic collapse. Northerners quickly discovered that their great wealth and employment depended on the South, on manufacturing for the South, on financing Southern agriculture, on shipping Southern commodities around the world, Cotton alone made up to 60% of U.S. exports in 1860. This was the era of the Pax Britannica and Great Britain ruled world trade, not the North. The North's big, biggest customer by far was the South. Economic historians Philip S. Fawner wrote extensively on business in the North in his excellent book, Business and Slavery. The New York Merchants and the Irrepressible Conflict. He explains with crystal clarity why the North quickly decided that war was preferable to economic ruin. It was also exceedingly logical that when all the efforts to save the Union peacefully had failed, the merchants, regardless of political views, should have endorsed the recourse to an armed policy. They had conducted their long struggle to prevent the dissolution of the Union because they knew that their very existence as businessmen depended upon the outcome. All right, remember these merchants from the North. And who's these merchants? Remember, a lot of these are descendants of Sephardic and Moorish people. All right, these merchants, too. Again, it's not about color. When they finally became aware of the economic chaos, secession was causing. When they saw the entire business system crumbling before their very eyes, they knew that there was no choice left. The union must be preserved, and any other outcome meant economic suicide. Emphasis added. Remember, that was part of Lincoln's campaign. He said it in many speeches. He doesn't really care about slavery. It was about preserving the union. Now you understand what that meant, preserving, meaning they're about to go bankrupt. They're about to not even be a union or a country or whatever they were considered, right? That was the choice the North was facing, preserve the union or face economic disaster, which meant that the collapse of the entire North into anarchy. Northerners were not concerned about slavery when their economic house was a raging inferno. The most prominent econ economist of the antebellum era, Thomas Prentice Kettle, wrote a famous book entitled Southern Wealth and Northern Profits as exhibited in statistical facts and official figures showing the necessity of union to the future prosperity and welfare of the Republic. All right. Primary source letting you know. He argued that the Southerners were producing the wealth of the United States with cotton and other commodities, but Northerners were taking all the profits. Kettle understood the extensive interaction between the two regions and the North's dependence on the South. These transactions influenced the earnings, more or less direct, or of every Northern man. A portion of every artisan's work is paid for by Southern means. Every carman draws pay more or less from the trade of that section, the South, the agents who sell manufacturers, the merchants who sell imported goods, the ships that carry them, the builders of the ships, the lumbermen who furnish the material 
and all those who supply means of support to them and their families. The brokers, the dealers in southern produce, the exchange dealers, the bankers, the insurance companies, and all those who are actively employed and receiving then distributing southern produce with the long train of persons who furnish them with houses, clothing, supplies, education, religion, amusement, transportation, etc., are dependent upon this active interchange by which at least 1,000 millions of dollars come and go between the North and South in a year. There were two components of the North's enormous economic success. The first was simply the luck of having the agricultural region as successful as the South to do for. The South was vast, warm, fertile, and productive. Southerners were as ambitious as Northerners and wanted to make money too. They did so with agriculture. It had been this way since Jamestown when colonists found they could make fortunes with tobacco. Then later when the cotton gin made short staple cotton profitable per capita income in the South in the years before the war was roughly the same as in the North. So supplying the successful South with goods and services and shipping for the South gave Northerners jobs. The second was the utterly unfair taxation of the South for the direct benefit of the North. Three-fourths of the federal treasury was supplied by the South, yet three-fourths of the federal tax revenue was spent in the North. It was mostly Southerners who had to pay the high tariffs that protected northern businesses and industry. All right, you see that? It was a direct transfer out of the South and into the pockets of northerners. In a frank editorial, what shall be done for a revenue? March 2nd, 1861, one month before the bombardment of Fort Sumter, the New York Evening Post writes that either the revenue from duties must be collected in the ports of the rebel states or the ports must be close to importations from abroad is generally admitted. If neither of these things be done, our revenue laws are substantially repealed. The sources which supply our treasury will be dried up. We shall have no money to carry on the government. The nation will become bankrupt before the next crop of corn is ripe. There will be nothing to furnish means of substances to the army, nothing to keep our navy afloat, nothing to pay the salaries of the public officers the present order of things must come to a dead stop emphasis added think about the american revolution and the taxation without representation issue those taxes were minuscule compared to 1860 when millions of dollars were ye per year were flowing straight out of the south and into the pockets of northerners those northerners had not earned a penny of it It was through government manipulation that they had managed to get a monopoly status for most northern industries and shipping, which killed competition and allowed northerners to charge high rates. There was a protective tariff and bounties and subsidies to northern businesses that were like tax credits and payments from the federal treasury, even though most of the money in the federal treasury, three-fourths of it, had come from the South. The report on the causes of the secession of Georgia stated it clearly. The material prosperity of the North was greatly dependent on the federal government, that of the South not at all. The great Southern writer William Gilmore Sims knew the North well and concluded the same. No doubt in one sense they cherished the Union but only as the agency by which they prosper in uncounted prosperity. It is to them the very breath of life. It has made them rich and powerful and keeps them so. No doubt they love the South, but it is as the wolves love the lamb, coveting and devouring it. So you see the comparison he made there, right? Southerners woke up one day and realized that they were being robbed blind and from then on they would have no way to protect themselves. Henceforth in American history the South would be outvoted by the North in any manner of confiscatory economic manipulation could and would continue. The North had four times the white voting population the Republican Party had 
rely, rallied them. The governance of the entire country would now be by the North, for the North. George Washington had warned against sectional parties, but Wendell Phillips proudly stated that the Republican Party was the party of the North pledged against the South. Alexis de Tocqueville had predicted that if any one state gained enough power to control the government, it would make the rest of the country tributary to its power and would rule for its benefit. That's exactly what happened, except it wasn't one state, it was the northern states with their similar commercial interests, all right? You see that? That's what happened. This section from the Address of People of South Carolina assembled in convention to the people of the slaveholding states of the United States in December of 1860 explains precisely why the southern states were now in the exact same position toward the north that the colonies had been toward Great Britain, all right? It says, the revolution of 1776 turned upon one great principle, self-government and self-taxation, the criterion of self-government, where the interests of two peoples united together under one government are different. Each must have the power to protect its interest by the organization of the government, or they cannot be free. The interests of Great Britain and of the colonies were different and antagonistic. Great Britain was the serious of carrying out the policy of all nations towards their colonies, of making them tributary to her wealth and power. The southern states now stand exactly in the same position towards the northern states that the colonies did towards Great Britain. The northern states, having the majority in Congress, claim the same power, omnipotence, and legislation as the British Parliament. The general welfare is the only limit to the legislation of either and the majority in Congress, as in the British Parliament are the sole judges of the expediency of the legislation this general welfare requires. Thus the government of the United States has become a consolidated government and the people of the southern states are compelled to meet the very de despotism their fathers threw off in the revolution of 1776. For the last 40 years the taxes laid by the Congress of the United States have been laid with a view of subserving the interests of the North. The people of the South have been taxed by duties on imports, not for revenue, but for an object inconsistent with revenue, to promote by prohibitions northern interests in the productions of their mines and manufacturers. The people of the southern states are not only taxed for the benefit of the northern states, but after the taxes are collected, three-fourths of them are expanded at the north. This cause with others connected with the operation of the general government has made the cities of the South provincial. Their growth is paralyzed. They are mere suburbs of the northern cities. The agricultural production of the South are the basis of the foreign commerce of the United States, yet southern cities do not carry it on. No man can, for a moment, believe that our ancestors intended to establish over their posterity exactly the same sort of government they had overthrown. All right, so that was a big way to describe it. You see how they're letting you know that the North basically was doing the same thing, you know, Great Britain was doing to the American colonists, right, in the American Revolutionary War. Same thing. All this had started right after the revolution, when Northerners begged for federal protection for their industries to get them going so they could compete with Great Britain. Southerners had gone along without of the good feelings from winning the revolution and patriotism. But like Ronald Reagan said, the closest thing to eternal life is a government program and none of the measures protecting northern industry ever ended. The North became dependent on them, like a drug addict, and it clamored for more and more. It was nothing but northern greed for other people's money, and it's it, not slavery, all right? It was about money, the greed for other people's money, and not slavery was the seed that grew into the war, all right? Not slavery. Texas Representative John H. Regan told Northern Representatives in early 1861, You are not content with the vast millions of tribute we pay you annually on the, under the operation of our revenue law, our navigation laws, your fishing bounties, and by making your people our manufacturers, our merchants, our shippers. 
You are not satisfied with the vast tribute we pay you to build up your great cities, your railroads, your canals. You are not satisfied with the millions of tribute we have been paying you on account of the balance of exchange which you hold against us. You are not satisfied that we of the South are almost reduced to the condition of overseers for Northern capitalists. The most quoted phrase from the secession debate in the South in the months leading up to the secession comes from the Declaration of Independence. Governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed, that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Any government that forces a region to pay three-fourths of the country's taxes, then turns around and spends three-fourths of the tax money in a different region for the benefit of those who demanded the taxes but pay little themselves, is a thief and a far worse tyranny than Great Britain in 1776. They were worse than Great Britain, all right? The Northern states, they were way worse. The federal government in 1860 did not have the consent of the government in the South or any just powers. It had become the enemy of 9 million Southerners, just as Great Britain had become the enemy of 3 million colonists in 1776. There is not one iota of difference in 1776 and 1861. That's why Northern biased and politically correct historians are so determined, right? Politically correct. It gotta fit the slave narrative, right? Politically correct. Are so determined. They so determined these gatekeepers to keep the focus on slavery as the cause of the war with the implication that Northerners are the good guys and Southerners the bad, all right? Just like little kids, we got fooled. That's the good guys, that's the bad guys, okay? Even though slavery as the cause of the American war between the states is one of the biggest frauds. All right? It's one of the biggest, biggest frauds in world history. It's all a lie. It's a big fraud, as noted by Charles Dickens, who was a contemporary. Northerners don't want to be the British in the second American Revolution, but they were. They were far worse. Georgia Senator Robert Toombs created an apt metaphor, a suction pump to describe the Northern confiscation of southern money which was made up of bounties and protection of every interest and every pursuit in the north to the extent of at least 50 millions per annum besides the expenditure of at least 60 millions out of every 70 of the public expenditure among them thus making the treasury a perpetual fertilizing stream to them and their industry a suction pump to drain away our substance and parch up our lands. Henry L. Benning, nicknamed Rock, and for whom the sprawling U.S. Army base Fort Benning, near Columbus, Georgia is named, calculated the exact amount flowing through Tomb's suction pump. Eighty-five millions is the amount of the drains from the south to the north in one year drains in return for which the South receives nothing. Benin argues that this $85 million, a gargantuan sum in 1861, that's a lot of money back in 1861, was not legitimately earned profit, but the extra above normal profit that Southerners had to pay because prices were higher than they should have been. Monopolies protected Northern businesses and shipping exempted them from market competition therefore they had no incentive to keep costs down they could charge what they wanted and of course it was going to be as much as they could get when a customer needs a product but the government says you can only buy from one supplier you have to pay that supplier price even though a hundred suppliers might make the exact same product and charge half the price say it's 1860 and you need a widget on your farm that costs 50 dollars from any several different european companies you would have your choice, but then the federal government steps in and says you can only buy from Monopoly Company of the North and their price is $175. 
the hundred and twenty five dollar difference is what Benin is talking about. That's a lot of money they would add. See those taxes they were adding. It is unearned money sucked out of the South and deposited into the pockets of northerners simply because the northern owners of monopoly company of the North lobbied the federal government to grant the monopoly status. The same thing happened with monopoly shipping rates. The tariff worked similarly too. It allowed northern businesses to ignore market competition and charge right up the level of the tariff. The higher a tariff they could get through political manipulation, the more money that went into their pockets. Preserving the union, the North's money machine, its suction pump, its cash cow, was critical, not just desirable, as the northern businessmen concluded. The union must be preserved. Any other outcome meant economic suicide, which meant bankruptcy, anarchy, and societal collapse. Lincoln and the Northern Congress understood this completely and agreed wholeheartedly, which is why they say over and over and over, the war between the states is about preserving the Union, not ending slavery. Slavery obviously is not why the North went to war in the weeks before the bombardment of Fort Sumter. Northerners either bent over backwards to protect slavery or were virtually silent on the slavery issue. But they were screaming at the threshold of pain about the impending economic catastrophe. The prescient Benin asked a question which predicted the violent future with 100% accuracy. The North cut off from southern cotton, rice, tobacco, and other southern products would lose three-fourths of her commerce and a very large proportion of her manufacturers, and thus those great fountains of finance would sink very low. Would not the North in such a condition as that declare war against the South? All right, so that was deep. He predicted what they were going to do. He knew as soon as he cut up the pipeline, the money, right? They were going to like, oh, we're going to war. Oh, they, oh, they playing with the money? Oh, you know, what that, oh, you know what's going to happen. These are the issues that caused the war between the states. It had nothing whatsoever to do with slavery, all right? People had nothing to do with slavery. It's not me saying this. These are not my opinions. These are just, this is just history, especially not with any kindness on the part of the North toward black people or desire by the North to end slavery. Now, remember, Dr. Hijack with crayon colors. Remember who's the president. Abraham Lincoln is a so-called black, black man, right? So it's not about freeing so-called black people or ending slavery. We already got all the sources. We got the truth. Let's not go backwards. Remember the past presentations. Let's put it into reference here. Lincoln is a so-called black man. So it's not about crayon colors. <laughs> it was all about money, power, and the ascendance of one region's economic interests over another's. Charles Dickens, author of A Christmas Carol, David Copperfield and so many other wonderful books who is thought of as a literary colossus and the greatest novelist of the Victorian period also published a periodical all the year round. He was up on current events and horrified by the American war. He correctly identified it as a tariff war over economic issues and slavery has in reality nothing on earth to do with it. All right, Charles Dickens said that. Dickens said the federal government compelled the South to pay a heavy fine into the pockets of northern manufacturers so that every feeling and interest on the one side, South, calls for political partition and every pocket interest on the other side, North, for union. Dickens said the North, having gradually got to the itself the making of the laws and the settlement of the tariffs, taxed the South most abominably for its own advantage. He noted the hypocrisy of the North and its bad treatment of black people and the South's right to succeed, all right, or their own slaves, not just so-called black people. They had white servants too. And he says here, every reasonable creature may know it willing that the North hates the Negro and that until it was convenient to make a pretense that sympathy with him was the cause of the war, it hated the abolitionists and derided them up hill and down dale. For the rest, there is not a pin to choose between the two parties. They will both rant and lie and fight. 
until they come to a compromise and the slave may be thrown into that compromise or thrown out of it just as it happens as to secession being rebellion it is distinctively provable by state papers that washington considered it no such thing all right the massachusetts now loudest against it has itself asserted its right to succeed again and again and that years ago when two carolinas began to train their militia expressly for succession commissioners were sent to treat with them and to represent the disastrous policy of such a secession who never dreamed of hinting that it would be rebellion dickens was adamant that the quarrel between north and south is as it stands solely a fiscal quarrel because union means so many millions a year lost to the south secession means the loss of the same millions to the north the loss of money is the root of this as of many many other evils of course it is the northern love of other people's money that is the root of all evil dickens is talking about southerners were simply trying to keep their money from being confiscated by the government and given to the northerners just as the colonists were trying to keep their money from being confiscated by king george iii and distributed throughout the british empire every man and woman can understand that nobody wants their hard-earned money confiscated by the government and given to somebody else dickens famous biographer peter accord used scrooge's favorite word to describe the northern lie later in the war that slavery was suddenly their reason for fighting even though the emancipation proclamation freed no slaves or few deliberately left close to a half million in slavery in the five union slave states and left hundreds of thousands in slavery and captured now remember what he's talking about we got this in the previous parts of this series the south i mean sorry the union only freed the ones in the south they didn't free the slaves they had in the union they had thousands of slaves too and they didn't free them they didn't free the ones in the union so it wasn't about freeing slaves okay as i see a confederate territory accurate rights the northern onslaught upon slavery was no more than a piece of specious humbug designed to conceal his desire for economic control of the southern states all right so that was uh chapter three we're going to get into this chapter next time all right so again more correlation of what the real a more real reason of why they would go into a so-called civil war and why the south was really succeeding they were kind of forced to right but again it's all about the money it's all about that money back shout out to back for what's mine